Smoldering. Okay, that seems to describe it pretty well. Is it really the mechanism that drives multiple sclerosis progression? Well, hello and welcome to another episode of You and Me and Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam and I've been living with multiple sclerosis for almost 39 years. I am diagnosed as secondary progressive MS, which I've often said is the no man's land of multiple sclerosis because no two people with SPMS are the same, that's for sure. But one question I think all of us have is, so what's going to be the end point? Is this going to keep progressing? Is there any hope that it'll stop, that it'll be reversed, anything at all? We're just wondering now what the medical community is looking to do with secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. I do my best to keep you up to date on the things that I think sound pretty promising, preferably things that I've either tried myself or am willing to try myself. Recently, I started looking at the papers that were coming out of this year's European Conference on Multiple Sclerosis, ECTRAMS, and I'll be telling you more about that over time. But my eye got caught by something, and I thought I'd stop and show you what I found and go through it a little bit, because I think it's a useful tool. I learned a few things. I hope that maybe you will, too. Well, as you know, I get alerts from a site called MedPage Today, and apparently it's more targeted at healthcare professionals than at the average person or the patient, but it's okay because the information on there is worth knowing about, and we can always get the latest research in multiple sclerosis. Well, when I went out to an article from MedPage Today, I saw this advertisement pop up and it actually, in, in real life, it's animated, and it continues to scroll through some different statistics about smoldering MS. But the term really caught my eye because, as you probably know, if you've been watching the channel, I've been following this with great interest as Dr. Gavin Giovannoni, otherwise known as Professor G., talks about smoldering MS and how it's the real MS, how the MS that's going on below the clinical level where it can really be detected by a physician's exam, including MRI sometimes, is really what's going on with MS. It's happening at the cellular level in our microglia. So given that somebody else is using this term, I felt like I really should look into it a little bit and see what they had to say. And when I clicked on it, here was the site that I got, Unraveling Smoldering MS. And I thought, well, before I go too far looking at this, I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom and just see who these folks are that are putting this site together. It's always good to know where things are coming from. And we'll get back to the content of it in a moment, but here we go. It's EMD Serono, and they are a division of Merck, which is a pharmaceutical company, and I know many of you have heard of them because they make a number of the medicines that we're familiar with. And it says that EMD Serono is the healthcare business of Merck KGAA, Darmstadt, Germany, in the U.S. and Canada. This website is intended for U.S. healthcare professionals only, but the nice thing it's got going for it is that it's current as of August of 2023, so that, of course, makes it worth looking at. And even though it says it's for healthcare professionals, I gotta wonder, is there something in here that maybe we can find of use? Bear in mind, then, as we're looking through this, this is the kind of thing that your doctor might look at and see what the current thinking might be with respect to MS and its progression. And they start out by saying reducing relapses and MRI activity is only part of the battle. So smoldering MS is possibly starting to unravel our abilities. And here's the question, of course, for many physicians. I'm sure that 
patients come in with these questions and doctors try to, to come up with an answer. Her relapse frequency has reduced, so why are there subtle changes to her abilities? And it goes on to say, when patients gradually experience loss of ability, despite their MS appearing stable, smoldering MS may be to blame. Smoldering MS refers to chronic central nervous system compartmentalized inflammation. In other words, inflammation that's limited to the brain and spinal cord that leads to subtle accumulation of disability even in the absence of relapses. That's a pretty nice definition. I think Dr. Giovannoni would agree with that. They, they describe the impact of smoldering MS as follows. Recent evidence indicates disability accumulation is driv driven by smoldering MS is prevalent regardless of relapse activity occurs even in the earliest stages of the disease. And I think this is something that researchers in MS are beginning to understand that the mechanisms of multiple sclerosis begin to work on our brain and spinal cord sometimes years before there's any clinical manifestation that would make us think we need to go to a doctor. As they say, looking closely at patients with relapsing MS over time reveals that many experience slow but persistent worsening of day-to-day -day functions and abilities, a range of sy symptoms that include the following, and these are ones that most of us are very familiar with, brain fog, fatigue, diminished fine motor skills, bowel and bladder issues, and gait abnormalities. And I am not sure about the first one because, you know, sometimes you're the last one to know if you've got brain fog. But all those other ones, I would definitely say, are part of my daily life and annoying at that, at least. <laughs> annoying, limiting, many other things could be said about them. But yes, so these are all characteristic of the results of having MS that is progressing. This worsening can, in, can occur, they say, independent of relapses or new lesions. If left unchecked, a patient's disability may continue to accumulate. A deeper understanding of smoldering MS could provide clinical insights into the bigger picture of long-term disability accumulation and the underlying biology of MS itself. And then they invite you to go on and explore the evolving paradigm of smoldering multiple sclerosis. And they say that more and more experts are acknowledging that smoldering disease is a major challenge for patients with relapsing MS. And of course, when they say, hear what your peers are saying, look who they quote. Professor G himself. Overwhelming evidence from MRI and pathological studies indicate that progressive neuroaxonal loss that underpins the accumulation of disability is present from the very early stages of the disease. Other experts also weigh in. I'm going to link this, pa this page, by the way, because I think that there's a lot on here that you might want to spend a little more time looking at. But as you can see, that he is not alone in his belief that smoldering MS is a primary mechanism of MS progression. Here's a quote from Dr. Stephen Krieger, by the way. While there has been increasing recognition of silent progression late in the MS disease course, the silent burden of disease in early MS merits consideration. And I point this out not just because I have mentioned Dr. Krieger before, but that there are multiple ways that, that this concept is expressed while Dr. Giovannoni and others refer to it as smoldering MS, it is also referred to as silent progression. You're also going to see it referred to clinically as progression independent of relapse activity, P-I-R-A or PIRA. But they all mean the same thing. And then, of course, smoldering MS is complex, but research is ongoing. The emerging science behind smoldering MS highlights an opportunity for refinement within today's approach to MS. There remains a need to better understand both drivers of neuroinflammation, not just the peripherally initiated components, but also the central nervous system compartmentalized processes that characterize smoldering MS. 
further work is being done to understand the role that BTK plays in impacting both of these sources of inflammation that contribute to total disability accumulation. And we have talked about BTK, Bruton tyrosine kinase, and the BTK inhibitor research that's been done and is very much ongoing. And I find that one of the most exciting developments in MS, that BTK inhibitors may actually function to stop progressive MS because they may work on the smoldering part of MS. But more about that in a moment. Let's take a look at some of these subheadings. Smoldering MS and the picture and the bigger picture of total disability. It says our previous understanding of disability accumulation in MS was primarily viewed through the lens of relapses and visible T1 or T2 lesions on MRI scans a consequence of inflammation triggered by B and T cells from the periphery infiltrating into the CNS. This is an important thing to realize, that when you go in and you have an MRI and they see lesions on your brain, those are not the cause of MS. The lesions do not cause MS. The lesions are the result of the inflammation that is the driver of MS and MS progression. So just because we see the results of something, it's sort of like seeing a tree blown over by the wind. The wind caused the tree to blow over, though you do not actually see the wind. I think that may, <laughs> that may be a little bit of a stretch on the analogy, but it's the best I can do off the top of my head. They say the traditional sequential MS paradigm is the following. First, a period of intermittent peripherally initiated focal inflammation, followed by a period of rapid progressive diffuse neurodegeneration and disability accumulation. So that's pretty standard. That's how we've come to understand the course of most cases of multiple sclerosis. And here's the, here's the graph of that. Stage one and stage two. I think you've seen this before. I've shown it in other videos that in the beginning, in stage one, when you're in the relapsing phase, you have exacerbations followed by recovery. And at first, as you see that first one on the far left, you recover to pretty much the state that you were in before. But over time, those relapses have additive damage. When you get to stage two, and you could debate on the slope of that line, but that's your progressive MS. So at that point, the progression that you have is not in the form of relapses and remissions, but continual progression without substantial recovery in between. And of course, your slope may be pretty gentle, like mine tends to be, or it could be even more severe than what's shown there. But the point is that you're no longer in the stage where you get new symptoms and then you recover and there's not a lot of difference between your new state and your baseline, at least not at first. But here's the emerging paradigm. Both kinds of MS, both, both the RAW and smoldering-induced progression independent of relapse activity start early says evidence increasingly shows that gradual neurodegeneration can be present from the start. This is because despite experiencing fewer relapses and reduced MRI activity, patients on current MS treatments continue to accrue disability. So the treatments that we are on do not stop the disease, even though it may feel in some cases like the treatments are working, quote unquote, all they're doing at best is slowing the inevitable progression because the progression is happening beneath the level of clinical detection. So they say that in this emerging paradigm, MS, chronic inflammation within the central nervous system, leads to progression independent of relapse activity. This process is believed to both start early and persist throughout the disease course. In contrast, the stepwise relapse-associated worsening, or RAW, which is driven by acute inflammation, begins early but wanes over time. As a result, both peripherally initiated inflammation and smoldering MS 
contribute to neurodegeneration and subsequent disability accumulation in multiple sclerosis. Smoldering MS, they say, is driven by immune cells residing within the central nervous system, such as microglia, that become chronically activated, causing diffuse damage to white and gray matter, while acute inflammation initiated by peripheral B and T cell infiltration into the CNS causes relapses that subsequently subside, as you saw in the earlier chart. CNS compartmentalized inflammation can continue to smolder, can and I would say almost always does. And they go on to talk about what they call the emerging concurrent paradigms. Both, smolder, both smoldering MS-induced PIRA and RAW drive total disability accumulation from the start. And as they show here in the diagram, let's see if this video will play for us. Yep, so here we are in early MS with the relapses and the remissions. But then we move on. Over time, there's more progression. Even when we go into quote-unquote remission, our baseline is not the same as it was before. And what they're showing here is what the treatments could do. So the treatments can slow the progression and reduce the number of relapses, but they're not stopping it. They're not stopping it. It's continuing on. And by late MS, you may have accumulated substantial disability. Total disability progression, they say, the loss of patient abilities is the combined result of both RAW and smoldering MS induced PRIA that may occur across the continuum of relapsing MS, even for patients on treatment. The impact of progression independent of relapse activity can affect many aspects of patients' lives, and it occurs from the earliest stages of the disease. It can affect cognition. Cognitive impairment can present before typical clinical symptoms of MS. In other words, walking difficulties or numbness and tingling appear contributing to loss of employment, accidents, impairment of daily functions, and loss of social contacts. Fatigue, of course. Fatigue is experienced by over 75% of patients with MS. The impact of accumulating fatigue on quality of life can sometimes exceed that associated with other causes of disability, and I guess I would, I would tend to agree on that. If most of us had to say what is the most troubling MS symptom, what is the one that limits our quality of life and our ability to function as we wish we could, fatigue has got to be one or two, right? Number one or number two. And subtle motor function. Patients with no disability according to conventional measures, in other words, they might have an EDSS score of zero, may still exhibit neurological deficits such as compromised balance, coordination, and dexterity. And in my early stages of having MS, I would agree that that's pretty much how it would have been. I would have felt like during my remissions, I went back to zero, but I don't think that was really true. I don't think I trusted my balance. I was not as coordinated, though I have never been a great one for that. And certainly, dexterity has not been my strong suit as the disease has progressed. I used to play jacks a lot because that was a big thing back then. I don't think I could do it now. I bought some jacks and I've been afraid to try that because I just don't think I would have the dexterity or even the ability to deal with a bouncing ball and picking up jacks at the same time. But it would be curious. Maybe I'll get brave and try it. Instead of going on to the case studies, let's just scroll down here real quick. I want to show you the references because some of these names are people we've talked about before, particularly number three, Gavin Giovannoni. I almost don't think you can talk about smoldering MS without talking about Professor G. And so if you, I will link some of the videos I've made about his work down below. Definitely check it out because unlike some MS research that perhaps for a season was the big news in MS, 
His has stood the test of time, and I think people are using his earlier work to build on what they are looking at now, what kinds of clinical trials are being done, and the research agenda for the future of MS. Now, if we click on pathophysiology, we're going to, this may be the part that's more technical. I've been impressed so far that this website, although targeted at healthcare professionals, has not been particularly over our heads. I hope you're finding that to be the case as well. And they say that increasing evidence suggests that inflammation in MS is initiated both by peripheral immune cells and CNS re resident immune cells. Primarily targeting peripheral immune cells may allow chronic neuroinflammation driven predominantly by CNS resident immune cells to persist. So if we treat the symptoms, we're not treating the cause. And here again, you see Professor G is reference number four. And number six, as you can see here, is someone else we've talked about recently, Dr. Stephen Hauser, whose memoir I've been reading right now, and I'm not through it yet. But very interesting that uh, these names keep reappearing. Here's a section on focusing on microglia in the CNS. It says early in the course of MS, microglia, which account for 5% to 20% of the total glial cell population in the brain, begin to switch from a homeostatic or resting to a pathogenic or activated phenotype, contributing to the initiation of smoldering MS. So the conversion of these microglia seems to be at the root of this. And here is a graphical depiction of what they just said. So the homeostatic one, the homeostatic glial cell is involved in neuroprotection, in myelin repair, and in anti-inflammatory functions. So these microglial cells are very important to our continuing health. But when they turn pathogenic, as you see over here on the right, it's characterized by inhibition of remyelination, increased demyelination, chronic neuroinflammation, disruptive network connectivity, which means, of course, our networks are disruptive and all of a sudden our nerve signals aren't working like they used to. Release of inflammatory cytokines, nasty, nasty things, and overactive synaptic pruning. So there's all kinds of bad stuff that happens because our microglia are no longer functioning as they were designed. They say activated microglia act as key players in many of the chronic neuroinflammatory processes that contribute to smoldering MS by releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines, reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, and proteolytic enzymes. Once activated, pathogenic microglia can lead to increased downstream brain atrophy regardless of relapse activity. So there's another thing, that, there's a causal link why is your brain shrinking? It looks like this may be a large part of the reason. Pathogenic microglia. Definitely not good. Additionally, pathogenic microglia can lead to the activation of other immune cells, such as T cells, which can further trigger a peripheral immune response. When this occurs, activated T cells and B cells pass from the periphery into the CNS, resulting in worsening inflammation and potentially leading to relapse. And then they have a section on visualizing the effects of microglia activity in smoldering MS. After acute inflammation, as visualized with gadolinium enhancement, subsides, some lesions may still have ongoing inflammation due to activated microglia and microphages. When these chronic active or smoldering lesions continue to grow in size, they are called slowly expanding lesions, or SELs. We're going to see that acronym periodically in this presentation, so you might want to make a note of that, slowly expanding lesions. If these lesions have activated microglia and macrophages that are enriched with iron that can be detected on MRI, they are called paramagnetic rim lesions. PRLs, and those would be the, the rim of a, say, a, it starts as a white spot, and even when it becomes a black hole in your brain, that rim 
may still very well have these active microphages. And we've covered this sort of, we're not going to continue on with that. Down here, they talk about, in graphical form, the impact of chronic active lesions. And bear in mind, I'm not really sure why they have a line going between all these things, because they're not showing it as progression from the one on the left to the one on the right. I think these are just things that could happen. So on the left, we talk about long-term disease progression in patients with relapsing MS, disability worsening, cognitive impairment, brain atrophy, and secondary progressive conversion. So while a person might not go through all these different phases, I guess this is sort of intended to show that somehow in some series of steps and phases, you go from relapsing MS to progressive MS. And this is one way that that might look, but there are other ways, of course. I'm a good example of that because I don't. I know that I've had brain atrophy at a very young age. I started with that. But as far as the cognitive decline, that has not been a compelling symptom for me over time. And then they talk about an, an evolving clinical approach to monitoring neuroinflammation. As our understanding of the biological mechanisms behind MS progression has evolved, more methods than ever before have become available to track if and how inflammation is occurring. And it says that both kinds of inflammation impact biolo multiple biological mechanisms that underlie disability accumulation. There, by clicking on it, I got it a little more visible for us. And this, this is a, a useful diagram because it shows the acute lesion up there in the top left that you can see with gadolinium enhancement on your MRI. But then you have the slowly expanding lesions, and you can find that on standard and advanced imaging. The activated microglia can be seen in a PET scan, apparently. The acute axonal damage and demyelination and remyelination can be detected with blood and, and cerebral spinal fluid neurofilament light source advanced imaging. So you may have had that done, you may not. It's something you might want to ask your doctor about. It might be something, depending on your stage of MS, that might be a useful thing for you to know. And then meningeal inflammation. Remember, the meninges are the layers of tissue that's, that encase the brain, that surround the brain. And again, with advanced imaging, some of that could be seen. So this is a useful diagram, and it gives you some of the idea of both the kinds of inflammation and what clinical techniques are used to find to discover whether or not you have that. But let's skip over here to the role of BTK in neuroinflammation. Bruton tyrosine kinase is an important regulator of activity for a wide range of immune cells implicated in multiple sclerosis including B cells in the periphery and microglia and B cells in the central nervous system. And another video that you can watch in your spare time. BTK regulates peripheral and CNS resident immune cells. Evidence suggests that elevated BTK expression may play an important role in key cell types that impact both smoldering MS and peripherally initiated inflammation. It says that BTK is involved in the activation, cytokine release, and APC function of B cells. It's an essential regulator of B cell development, proliferation, activation, differentiation, and functions such as antigen presentation, cytokine secretion, and production of antibodies. Overexpression of BTK in cells can result in antibody production and autoimmune disease. So in other words, BTK itself is not a bad thing. It actually has some good uses for us. It's important. But if it gets overexpressed, it can cause disease. What I find with MS is that it does seem to be a, a disease that's more characterized by hyperactivity than hypoactivity. So just as we are not immunocompromised in the way that most people would think of it, our problem is not that our immune system is too slow to react, but that it's too quick to react and that it tends to overreact 
And this looks to me like yet another example of where MS is a disease of overreaction. And I'm not going to go through all of this. I think this, again, is something that you can go through yourself and look at because there's a lot of good information in here, but this video could go on for a really long time. I think one thing you're finding is that rather than just a simple ad, this particular one, if a doctor were to sit down and really look through this, there's a lot of good information here, and I like how it's not written in such a technical manner that you have to be an MS specialist to understand it. I would think that your general practitioner might even be able to understand this well enough to help you make some decisions about a specialist that you would need to see or whether you would need to see one or be supportive in general of your treatment plan for multiple sclerosis says that BTK signaling impacts immune cells that drive both the peripherally initiated and the central nervous system compartmentalized smoldering MS sources of neuroinflammation responsible for neurodegeneration and disability progression due to or independent of relapse activity. And the question is, could an approach like this, one that targets both sources of inflammation, impact disability progression due to and independent of relapse activities. So we have to be able to hit both of them. The final section is assessing smoldering MS. Using patient reported outcomes, PROs, and other metrics to assess smoldering MS and progression independent of relapse activity. Unlike with, unlike with relapses, recognizing the clinical impact of smoldering MS may require a closer look. Taking the time to closely observe a patient's daily life can give a clearer picture of the impact of PIRA. While the EDSS is a useful and important measure, even patients with scores of zero, who seem neurologically normal, do not perform well on high challenge tasks, indicating the presence of underlying neurologic deficits. Speaking with your patients may reveal ways in which smoldering MS is impacting their life and daily activities. Now see this, to me, this section is really useful for the clinician. Listening to your patients is always a good idea, but here's kind of a framework for doing that. Patient reported outcomes that capture patient experience may reveal clinically relevant disability accumulation that would otherwise go unrecognized or underappreciated. And here are some select MS specific patient reported outcomes for use in clinical settings. And you've got the health related quality of life test, the EQ 5D 5L or the MS quality of life 54 score, or the neuro quality of life, or the short form health survey. For physical function, you've got the patient determined disease steps, the promised physical function MS SF15 patient reported outcomes measurement information systems, physical function MS short form, and by the way, most of these are not ones that you're going to know off the top of your head, but it might be worth looking at these and saying, well, I've never taken this test. It might be useful to do it and talk to your doctor because they can get this for you and administer it. And this might be really helpful for you. One thing that's helpful too is if you're fairly early in your course of disease, taking the same test at intervals over time will give you a good idea of whether you might be deteriorating in ways that you had not realized you were. When we live with ourselves day to day, it's maybe hard to see some of the minute changes because aren't we adapt so well. But this, these kinds of measures will help us see whether we are perhaps dealing with deficits that are worsening over time. There are also additional performance tests that can be used in a clinical setting like the symbol digit modalities test. Again, you can find out more about that I think if you even click on this little button here, yeah, so that'll give you a little bit more information on some of them here. 
I'm not going to go through this because I, yeah, I have a feeling this is going to be overload if I go on too long about it. But, but it's useful stuff to know. And this is a good site, I think, to refer to because it does have a lot of good information in it and good links to things. Now, I like this part. This is where they talk about the smoldering MS conversation with your patients. And here are some of the things that the patient might say. Tell me if you find yourself saying this either to your doctor or to other people that you talk to. I'm more tired than I used to be. Sorry, I've been having a hard time concentrating lately. It's getting harder and harder to make it through the day. I can't throw the ball for my dog like I used to. I'm having a hard time keeping my energy levels up at my job. I'm struggling to carry the groceries in from the car. Stairs are becoming sort of daunting lately. I can still climb them, but it's more of a struggle than before. This is another section that helps healthcare professionals know what they might speak with us about. Things we used to be able to do six months or a year ago that are now difficult. And as I go through these, you might reflect on your own course of MS and see, well, how would I answer some of these questions? Or whether their holiday routines have changed recently and if that change could be due to multiple sclerosis. So if you used to really enjoy decorating your house, you don't really care to do that anymore. It's just too big an outlay of energy or you've lost your motivation. That's an interesting data point, and I think that doctors should be aware of that. Whether you've had any recent issues getting around or doing things with your hands like texting. Yes, absolutely true for me. And any change in your ability to focus, and that may take many forms, depending on how you normally focus anyway. Some of us are not the most focused to begin with, but there's there's often noticeable changes over time even there and your energy throughout the day and if your sleep schedule has changed and how work has been going and if any concerns were raised at your last performance review if the doctor doesn't ask you these kinds of questions you might just give them the list and talk through some of them i think the more information your doctor has the better whether it's your ms specialist or your primary care provider, the more people know about the condition that you're dealing with, the better the advice that they'll give you and the, the better diagnosis they're going to make. And then finally, they talk about a holistic approach that may help manage the symptoms of smoldering MS, that additional research may reveal approaches to help minimize the accumulation of disability, but for now, a holistic approach to health could help. Lifestyle modifications can positively impact health and may help minimize disability accumulation. And these include, and these, these should be old friends. You've heard me talk about most of these numbers of times. Quitting smoking if you smoke, exercising, or as I like to refer to it as movement, because I think that's the key, just move. And even if you can't get out of your chair you can still do some stretching you can still do some thought exercises there's much value in any kind of movement improving your sleep hygiene reducing alcohol intake intake and improving diet and nutrition all good stuff so in other words keep your general health as stable as possible improve it if you can because all of that will help you manage your MS better. And if you were a healthcare professional, you'd be able to sign up for these updates. I did try, but then I saw that they want you to swear that you're a healthcare professional, and I can't swear to that, so I did not sign up. But like I said, even though this is, done, this is put together by a pharmaceutical company, the information is useful enough that I would like to keep apprised of it. And here we have the final list of references, Dr. Krieger's in that list, and Dr. Giovannoni down here at the bottom. I always feel a little more comfortable when I know the names of some of the folks that have been cited, because that I trust the research, especially of Professor G, 
If his name is affiliated with it, it certainly can't be based on totally bogus science. Even though it is a pharmaceutical company, there does seem to be some good science behind it. I don't know if it makes me feel more hopeful or not, but since Dr. Giovannoni's name is associated with it, as well as Dr. Krieger's and Dr. Hauser's and others whose names I know and whose work I respect, I'm willing to hang in there and see what comes of this. Bear in mind, if they came out with a major breakthrough right now, it still wouldn't be ready for prime time for a long time yet, years. Unless you're willing to be part of a clinical trial, which does carry risk, there's really no way to know how many years it's going to be before some new and exciting treatment that will slow down the progression of MS is available to those of us who've been living with it for a long, long time. But I remain hopeful because what other option is there? There's always hope. While people are working on it and thinking about it, sooner or later, somebody's going to come out with something that's actually going to work. So until that time, let's just take good care of our general health, right? Take really good care of yourself. And I'll see you again in my next video. Music